All right. Welcome to Marketing Monday, everyone. We're so glad that you're here and tuning in today after the holidays. We hope that all of your holidays were joyous and that you had a good time. Um, as we get back to business, we are talking about geese this month and wrapping things up. And our wonderful guest this week is Mr. John Metzer of Metzer Farms. John, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Uh, thank you, Brittany. Um, John Metzer, you got that part, <laughs> Metzer Farms. Um, I've been in the hatchery business, uh, predominantly waterfowl, uh, since 1978, when I graduated from Davis. Uh, took over my father's hobby and been at it ever since. Uh, my son joined me about five years ago. So we're located in California and we hatch and ship ducklings and goslings all over the United States and export. You know, our smallest order is two for hobbyists. And uh, then there's also uh, commercial orders of thousands of meat birds or uh birds that are going to be laying eggs. So we cover the whole gambit for um, ducklings and goslings. Great. Brian, did you have questions for John? Yeah. So uh, John, first off, thank you again for showing up. We really appreciate your time, effort, and energy. Um, I like with Marketing Mondays, just to be able to really showcase what it looks like to have a profitable enterprise of heritage, um, livestock, and poultry. Uh, and so I want to ask you a question really about, you know, you selling goslings and selling uh, birds. What for you has made it profitable with raising, selling geese? Uh, what are some enterprises that you use um, to kind of help you have a diversified overall enterprise? Well, for us, as we've grown, um, it's adding different breeds so that we have the breeds that probably 99.5% of people in the waterfowl world want um, in terms of different breeds of ducks and different breeds of geese. And I know we're speaking of geese today, but it holds true for both. You know, for somebody um, that is just wanting to get into heritage geese, um, what what makes it worthwhile to get into heritage geese and uh, how to sell them and then you know it's out there contacting people um, and being able to sell everything you produce it's always a balancing act as it is with any business enterprise uh, to sell everything you produce um, we've had people contact us and they really want to raise birds but I always tell them the first key is how are you going to sell these and where are you going to sell them? That's the first step. The first step not is to produce the product. The first step is to make sure you can sell the product. Whatever that, what, whether that's meat birds or feathers or eggs or pets or whatever, you know, kudos to you for doing it. But do some market research first. And, and, and I'm not saying that's easy, but just don't assume that you can sell them. I mean, if, if you're selling large number of commercial swine or beef, there's always an auction yard you can take them to. There's no such thing for heritage geese. <laughs> you know, those are going to be sold, you know, two or three or four or five at a time. Uh, so the second thing I recommend is to start small and grow from there. Um, it's less expensive to learn if you've got, you know, four female Sebastopol geese than if you have a hundred female Sebastopol geese. Uh, mistakes are easier to overcome with small numbers. And uh, as long as you remember what you've learned, then <laughs> you're better off. So uh, those are just some of the things that we recommend people um, is, is to gradually grow into it. I mean, we're still, we've been at this 40 years and we're still going to be adding breeds. We're, we're going to be adding at least one or two breeds this year. Um, and we just want to make it sort of our philosophy to add a breed or a strain. If we develop something ourselves, we're not going to call it a breed, but it might be a strain uh, of some kind of duck or goose. So um, you, you, you want to have something that's new and different. Um, I would say the other thing that is a requirement for profitability 
and it's something you want to concentrate on initially and the profitability will come later is a extreme service to your customers uh, in terms of product and uh, service do everything right for the customer and as long as you're faithful to that and i mean you're wise with your expenditures then uh, you will become profitable uh, but i don't you have much less likelihood or chance of long-term growth and profitability if you consider doing things the cheapest way first uh, is the most important to you or something to that effect or we want to produce this more than somebody else or we want to have 80 percent of the market or anything like that what you want to do is to make your customers happy and sometimes that even requires losing money on something um we ship birds every week and they're out of our hands once we give them to the post office but if there's losses we're the ones covering them and uh, people are very appreciative of that. They, they really do realize that once we've mailed them, they're not in our hands. But if there's a delay, we cover it. And so I think this, um, our, our customers appreciate that and, and they'll uh, come back because of that. So uh, number one is customer service and to make yourself profitable. Woo, customer service, oh man. It's bringing me back to retail days. Who man, those are not <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, I completely agree with you, John. Um, as someone who uh, used to farm and sell at farmers markets, uh, I realize the importance of customer service because there could be ten people in your same area who are selling the same thing that you are. But if you can provide excellent customer service, that makes you really more manageable people want to deal with you more so if the, oh, i got a pork chop i used to raise pork um i used to i got a pork chop and the, i realized the package was broken on and that it wasn't as good as i thought it was going to be no problem ma'am uh, here's another pork chop you have a good day and let us know how it tastes by the way and i would finesse and say and you know if you have social media you know take pictures of what your pork chop and and what you're doing with it, tag us in it, you know, getting them engaged, right? So instead of it becoming a simple uh, consumer provider relationship, it's really more of a uh, partnership and an experience uh, in a business endeavor. And so I think that's one of the really important things for anyone who's thinking about um, selling any type of heritage breed livestock is really looking at good and valuable customer service. Another thing I really appreciate you talking about was market research. I get calls a lot from uh, farmers on my personal line and they're like, you know, so uh, what, what kind of pigs should I buy? How, how many pigs should I raise? And I'm like, it depends. <laughs> you know, it's like, what, what is your, what's your- How many market? can you sell? <laughs> how many can you sell, right? You know, who, who have you talked to? Where do you want to sell to? So being able to have that first, um, before the website, before anything else, before you get pigs on the ground, or in this case, uh, geese on the ground, it's going to be super important for a farm because what that does is it allows for you not to waste time. It is so stressful figuring that out while you have animals that are ready to be processed, eggs that are ready to be sold, livestock that is ready to be shipped out, and you have no market. Um, so thank you for just mentioning that, John. Uh, speaking of markets, uh, I want to ask a quick question about, you know, I know some people are raising uh, geese for meat. Um, I know recently we were doing some cooking demonstrations earlier and people were really excited about, uh, you know, cooking goose. Um, and so what are some ideas that you might have for someone who's interested in raising geese for meat? Uh, what, are, what are some marketing tips that you might want to give somebody? I know we talked and you mentioned butcher shops and a couple of other specialty um, uh, retail providers. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, geese is a very specialized market um, for the meat. We'll just talk about meat for now. Um, th there's not a lot of consumers of meat, uh, as goose. Um, you might find it in a grocery store. I'm sure most people don't. Um, you might find it at a few restaurants. Most people won't. Um, 
So it, it's not a common item. But if you talk to anybody about goose meat, they'll think of typically the holidays, Christmas, New Year's, this kind of thing. So you want to sort of tag on to that would be my opinion. <clears throat> and we grow geese every year. The only product that we grow uh, animal wise to be processed and consumed is a, a flock of geese every year. But we don't do any marketing. I mean, we, we market them because we sell them to a processor. But then he's the one that sells them to the Whole Foods and to the butcher shops and things like that. Um, so with an extremely specialized item, I think you would want to initially go to the higher end. If you have butcher shops, if you have some nicer restaurants, they're always looking for something new. What did I say 10 minutes ago? We get a new breed every year because it's something new and different. Guess what? Every other business is almost in this same boat. So keep that in mind when you go to a butcher shop or a nicer restaurant and say, hey, you know, we're going to be producing geese. Would you be interested in offering this? Uh, that's how you start. It's just cold calls. Um, but it's not like you're selling something that nobody wants. There are going to be people that are they're going to say, hey, that's interesting, but that doesn't match what I've sell. Or that's really cool, but why don't you check with the chopping block in the next town over? You know, a lot of times people will be very helpful when, number one, they realize you're a farmer, uh, an entrepreneur on your own, and you have a unique product. So don't be afraid to go out and make cold calls. Um, we have lots of customers that started out with nothing and are now producing or selling whether it be eggs or meat locally uh, but again geese are expensive it takes a long time to produce them um, and so you, you want to go to those places that can pay you a little bit more and i'll throw something in that i didn't throw in before um, don't try to compete on price, um, you know, this goes in with the service part of it, because if if you're trying to make yours less expensive, it's going to then something else, it's going to appear of lesser quality. Um, so I'm not saying charge the most, but I'm just, and pricing is difficult for anybody, uh, but try to make sure that you're paying your own wages. Don't, don't just cover feed and heat and bedding and say, hey, I'm, I can cover this, I'm good to go. Well, then you're not paying yourself uh, for your time. And I think a lot of people new into a business, at, at some point, they just wanna cover their costs. Well, that's not very much fun, <laughs> you know, so, um, if you're providing excellent service, uh, people expect to pay a little bit more. So don't get caught in this. Uh, I remember uh, we were communicating with a fellow that said he wanted to buy lots of ducks. He was in Eastern Canada and he could sell all sorts of eggs. And this is when we were starting our business, Olanday Farms, which is uh, fresh duck eggs to food service and retail. And I'm thinking, well, what kind of secret does this fellow have? He just, he needs thousands of breeders and he's going to be producing thousands of dozens a week. And, you know, what's his plan? So I phoned him and he says, well, we're going to sell them cheaper in chicken eggs. Well, <laughs> number one, you can't produce them cheap, chick, cheaper than chicken eggs, you know. And so, he had big plans, but we really never heard from him again. Uh, I, I'm sure that either he realized that selling them cheap wasn't going to work or he ran out of money, one or the other. So um, anyway, uh, those are just some of the things to consider, you know, in, in marketing and in selling uh, a, a specialty product. Ah, oh, such beautiful wisdom, yes. Oh man, uh, again, uh, sometimes I feel like you're reading my mind a little bit, John. Um, Great minds think alike. Right, exactly. Even ours, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I encounter so many farmers who 
uh, have, I want to really say insecurity about selling their product for its actual worth or insecurity about actually paying themselves. A lot of farmers who want to be production farmers um, that I've encountered feel like, oh, well, I, I just do this because I love doing it. I was like, that doesn't mean you don't have to get paid as well. You know, even if um, uh, new beginning farmers always tell them, put put yourself on the books, you know, put yourself as a as line item for your expenses. Even if you, at, at, at where you currently are at, can't afford yourself, it, even paying yourself the minimum wage, right? Still can't afford yourself. At least you know how far down you are. That way you can kind of think of strategies to get yourself up, right? Get yourself in the black. Um, and so instead of completely ignoring the whole idea of paying yourself or really selling your, your products for its true value, really having that confidence to say, no, my work, my hard work, my blood, my sweat, and my tears are important. Those need to be compensated. Um, me producing a high quality product and all that goes with it, that's also important. Um, and so kind of, again, you mentioned about uh, production of geese being really expensive uh, or somewhat pricey. Kind of talk about what average expenses a new and beginning uh, geese farmer might experience. Um, you mean, the? did you say the expenses or selling price or? Uh, expenses. Oh, you expenses. can sell the prices too. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, um, th th I would say for heritage geese, you're either going to sell goslings to other hobbyists, or if you do decide to raise them for meat, um, because you might be able to sell feathers, but probably not uh, of any subsequent number there. You could sell the eggs maybe for hatching or maybe for consumption or maybe to be blown for decorating. But the main two items would be either the goslings um, and uh, the meat. So either way, the, the geese themselves um, are financially productive for five to seven years. So your breeders you're keeping for that period of time now so if you're producing if you're selling the goslings you're going to have the breeders you're going to have the incubators so you have to get the breeders initially and since heritage breeds are fairly rare you're going to be they're going to be fairly expensive compared to other geese or more expensive and then you're feeding them for a whole year before they're laying um, and much of the geese can be fed green grass, uh, but not everybody has green grass available <laughs> 12 months of the year. So um, you do have feed expenses. Um, and then when they start to lay the first year, they don't lay as many eggs. They're not as fertile. Uh, geese, goose eggs are a little harder to hatch. Um, so I'm not trying to dissuade anybody. I'm just saying those are some of the things to consider. And in my experience, if you try to work out a budget, um, always add on a contingency or say, you know, I'm only going to get 80% of what this book says I'm going to get. Or it says they should hatch at 70%. I'm going to put 50% because then you'll be pleasantly surprised or those, those areas will cover other things that you have not anticipated. Um, so... In, in terms of expenses, it's mainly the, the, the feed and the time. Obviously, you have to have some sort of housing depending on where you are. Um, geese handle cold weather extremely well. And we don't have snow where we are, but we work with farmers that are in Iowa. They have some very cold winters in Iowa. And they said that they're typically outside in the snow unless it's a blizzard. And that's really the only time they go inside or if they want to lay eggs inside. So geese are very tough, but you don't want to rely on that by giving them poor housing and they're not going to be happy. Um, somewhat of an example, um, when we first started in business, we had 
duck buildings and the duck breeders could go outside during the day and then we'd put them in at night. So they had the appropriate amount of space inside and then they had probably three times that outside. Mm -hmm. um, so there was no grass outside because, you know, they, they ate it all. But during the winter when it rained, it got pretty messy out there. Um, and so one year we ran an experiment. We said, okay, uh, we have two flocks of ruins. One we're going to keep inside 24-7. The other one we're going to let outside. We did this for about four different breeds. And all, for all four of them, those that stayed inside performed better than those that were allowed to go outside. Uh, I think just because they stayed cleaner, um, they didn't get mud balls on them, so to speak, which would just be mud on the end of their toes or something like that. So uh, I'm, I'm going a little far afield, but um, you, you want to provide them the correct um, housing for geese, even if they can handle extremely uh, cold weather. So other expenses, those are the major expenses. And obviously with the geese, um, that you're growing for processing. You have to feed them for quite a while. Um, and the other thing that I tell people that want to produce birds for meat, uh, number one, after you find out if there's a market, number two, find out where you can get them processed because that's not a given either by any means. Um, I think there's a trend of more portable or mobile processing units. Um, I mean, we don't do any processing ourselves, so I'm not really into it, but I've read more of those for the pasture poultry people uh, that they share them or they rent them or whatever. But um, the, 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 obviously there's no point in raising something if you can't get it processed. And I'll tell you that you're not gonna wanna process ducks or geese by hand. Um, too many of them because of so many feathers. You know, if your experience is a chicken, don't assume that applies to ducks and geese because they have so many more feathers. Uh, so that, that's difficult. So back to processing. I mean, um, you might be charged what you consider an astronomical amount to process a bird, but that processor has to make money. And if you're just bringing in a few birds, um, you know, it's a break in his line and different packaging and everything like that. So um, expenses would include that processing, which might be a big chunk right at the end. Uh, so again, you have to plan for that. Make sure you have somebody to process for you. How far do you have to take them? You know, do you have to book it? I know quite a few people that we sell to book processing pretty far in advance. So, um, that that's that's critical also. So the, you know, I don't I don't I don't have exact numbers. Um, I, I don't know if if you want exact numbers for expenses, um, but you know a feed cost varies throughout the nation. So I can't give you what it costs us is really going to apply to anybody else. Well, I was going to say you bring up a really good. Big topic going on during COVID-19, uh, which is uh, meat processing. And so it has been very difficult for a lot of farmers, livestock farmers, to find processing dates that aren't two years in advance. Mm -hmm. um, so fortunately in North Carolina and a couple other states, uh, there are what, what's known as poultry exempt processing where a farm can process up to 2,000 birds or 1,000 birds, depending on which state you're in. Some states don't have that. Um, and so me, I used to actually process poultry, um, chickens, ducks, turkeys. And you were right about processing ducks. They got a lot of feathers. Also, when you process chickens, you put them in a the little tumbler. That takes like, like two to a minute or two. For them feathers to come off, with ducks, you gotta really keep them in there for a while. Um, you know, while you're putting them in a scalding tank, you gotta make sure that you add some Dawn dish soap to it, um, because you know their feathers are are designed to be waterproof. 
Um, right. You know, and so being able to really process ducks is different from chickens. Um, it's not super complicated, but if you're willing to put in the energy, um, you can kind of, what you're talking about, cut some of your costs. Uh, if you are thinking of a long-term investment and you have the, the scale, the numbers to really warrant going and buying processing equipment, uh, even small scale processing equipment, it might be advantageous to go do that um, if you're a farmer. All right, questions, comments, thoughts, concerns. Uh, Brittany, do we have anyone that had any questions so far? We do, we've had a few come in, let's see. So Frontier Farmhouse says 100 geese in one place would be really noisy. <laughs> that is accurate. <laughs> <laughs> it, there's, I don't see a question mark after that. It should probably be an exclamation point, you know, <laughs> because they can be. Um, that is that is definitely true. It, it is a consideration with geese. Um, and there's some breeds that are noisier than others. Um, those from China, the Chinese geese, the African geese, they do make more noise. They're more talkative than some of the other breeds of geese. That's good to know. Well, thanks for tuning in today, Frontier Farmhouse. We're glad that you're here. Let's see. Baca says, hello, everyone. Hello. Thanks for tuning in today. Frontier Farmhouse also says, find a processor first. They change poultry processors because our previous one wouldn't process geese. So that yeah. sounds like very important information. Right. Because it, it, you know, it, the goose is a much bigger bird than a, a, a broiler might be. And um, uh, if it if they're physically incapable of doing it, uh, I can see them saying no. So, yeah, uh, that's as we said, that's part of the research up front. Absolutely. Vicki, thanks for tuning in today. She said excellent advice that can be applied in so many areas and levels. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Yeah, thank you. Lauren says hello. Hello, Lauren. Thanks for tuning in today. We're glad you're here. Terry says, I would add the value of geese as protection animals. I keep pilgrim geese with my flock of Saxony ducks. We do sell a few breeders every year and put a few in the freezer, but they but since they were raised with the ducks, they protect the entire flock. This is their greatest value. Yeah. Um, and, and that is true. Um, I, I don't want people to assume that a goose will protect chickens or ducks or a goose mate against a grizzly bear or a wolf. You know, so there's different levels of protection, but also just the noise is a level of protection. Uh, even if they, the goose doesn't go stand in the way of a fox or a predator, and it might, It'll be making noise, and number one, that can alert the human that's responsible for them, but it also makes noise that the predator, it may dissuade the predator, um, not a physical harm, but hey, I'm not able to sneak in here very quietly with that goose there. Uh, so uh, that is good to hear. Um, you know, I just don't have much experience uh, by doing that because all ours are protected by buildings, but... Uh, we do know that some predators you just can't keep away, but many of them you can. So thank you, Terry. Yes, thanks, Terry. That was great. Matt wanted to know, thanks for tuning in today, Matt. How much has the cost of goslings gone up? Is he, uh, uh, for Metzer Farms, um, it's gone up about 4% this year. Um, and we have a differential for males and females and for the females it's gone up a little bit and the males it's gone down a little bit because everybody likes to get, you know, a one to four ratio and that leaves us extra males. <clears throat> so, um, I, I have no idea about other hatcheries. I would expect we're, we're similar, uh, across the board and I'm not sure if he's speaking of Dale goslings or the cost of raising them, but I'm assuming the cost of a day old gosling. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for tuning in. If, if you want to specify, feel free to write in again and we'll get you. Let's see. 
Good discussion. Thanks for tuning in today, Cindy. We appreciate you being here. Frontier Farm asks, what is the ideal age to process a goose? They have Buff, Toulouse, and Emden. Uh, the ideal age is when they have no pin feathers. <laughs> 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 um, and I can't, uh, I can't give you an exact answer on that. Um, I can tell you what the little bit I've learned and what I've been told. So it's not going to be a black and white answer that you would like. And I'd like to give you uh, a bit of history in that uh, probably 20 years ago, we were raising geese uh, for processing for the Chinese market. And they liked them at a young age, at about nine weeks. And we were only able to process once a week. <clears throat> And we had a terrible time trying to provide geese that had no pin feathers. And we were basically unsuccessful. And so every week we would try different feeding regimes or doing it eight weeks or 10 weeks instead of nine weeks, because supposedly nine weeks is the ideal time. And we still had pin feathers. <clears throat> now, the, the, um, most people are not processing geese at nine weeks. That was purely for the Chinese market. Most people are going to, you know, 18 or 20 weeks. So um, theoretically, it's at about nine weeks and 14 weeks and 19 weeks are when it's supposed to be good. Well, I never hit that nine week. <laughs> so I can't swear to uh, 14 and 19 are good. But um, we, we have a, the person that we grow for, um, they never seem to care. Uh, we, we hatch them in July and they process them in, in early December. So let's see, that's July, August, September, October, November, 16, 18. You know, they're probably, they're past that 19 week. So, uh, those are probably all mature feathers and they're not gonna have any pin feathers at that point. So that's one way of doing it is to wait at least 19 or 20 weeks, uh, 21 weeks, and then for sure you've got mature feathers and they're not gonna go through another cycle. So I, I wish I could give you more of an exact answer, but I'll admit I don't have an answer. So I've told you everything around what you wanna know. <laughs> and I don't think, uh, again, I have no proof of this, but I doubt if there's a significant difference between the buff, Toulouse, and Emden in terms of timing, because they're all genetically from the same goose. And I doubt if there's been much selection pressure, so to speak, on one of those breeds for a faster or slower feather development. So you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I would guess if you find a perfect age for buff, it's going to work for Toulouse and Emden as long as they're all raised to the same. Because when I was trying to research the exact or the best <clears throat> processing date, a lot of people said, hey, it, a lot depends on the environment and stress and things like that. Not that they could give me a formula. They just said, if you think you have it figured out, wait until somebody changes feed on you or the birds get stressed. And then, you know, your calculations are out the window. So anyway, again, hopefully I've been of help, not as much as you want, but maybe a little bit more information. Well, that's a good question. Good answer. Yeah. John, I just want to say um, what you talk about uh, just now uh, is what I tell people uh, in terms of developing that farmer's eye right, where you were not just looking at what Extinction posted on their website, you know, but you're actually looking at your own personal flock, seeing what works and what doesn't work with the factors that you know. What do I need to fine tune here in this factor versus that factor to really get a good timing on processing or a good timing on, on weight gain? Uh, that's all dependent on your ability to have observational skills. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks for just mentioning that a lot of people get really bogged down with perfection and wanting to do things the right way. And the right way isn't always uh, the best way for you. Um, so right. thank you for that. 
Yeah, as, as an example, I'll throw in here, and it does have to do with geese. And it was not my, <clears throat> I can take no credit for it. But as I said, every year we grow about a thousand geese for processing. And <clears throat> our typical routine is a starter feed for about three weeks. And then we go what we call a grower feed. Um, and then later on, they're switched to a finisher. Well, oftentimes we have some leg problems. And so this year, unbeknownst to me, but it was good that he did it. He he went from a, a starter to a grower for a short period of time, and then he went to a maintenance. And our maintenance is normally just given to our breeder geese that are not laying. Um, and then toward the end, he switched to a finisher, um, and then they went to processing. And number one, we lost fewer geese due to leg problems, I think, because they weren't growing so fast early on. But which is even more surprising is that they averaged about two pounds more per goose than in the past. Now, this wow. is a total size of one year, right? So, you know, if we can reproduce this for several years, uh, that might have something to do with it. So I, 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 it was very interesting is it cause and effect? Don't know that. You know, you always have to be careful of, hey, this happened, therefore this happened too, so this must have caused this. Well, it doesn't work that way. Uh, there might have been something else going on. You know, it uh, it was a hot fall, and then when it cooled down, they ate more, and they gained more weight. You know, th there's so many factors that go into how animals do well, but this is just an example of Guillermo, who's been with me for 20 years and is responsible for the geese, said to himself, well, I'm going to switch to a, a maintenance earlier in the hopes that that slows their growth and we don't have leg problems. And, um, hey, you know, again, we don't know if it's cause and effect, but it's definitely worth looking at for the future. So, um I don't know where I started with that, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, maybe an thing that you have to observe, and <clears throat> you're correct. It, the, um, there's a lot that you can pick up in books, you know, for budgeting or a calendar, but those are just guides. Those are not mm -hmm. black and white. You have to follow it this way, right. because everybody's environment is different. Um, everybody's way of doing things is different. And, and I'll switch topics a little bit, maybe, um, in that in terms of observation, people will say, well, this happened. Why? Well, I invariably come back with what changed. You know, they'll say, my duck stopped laying. Um, I don't have any fertility. They're starting to lose feathers. They're not using the nest boxes. <clears throat> So invariably, invariably, something changed. So there has to be that observation of what changed to make them stop eating. What changed? You know, it requires going back and saying, oh, I bought a new sack of feed, or I used a different feeder, or I put the feeder in a new location. You know, all those things to a human, to you or I, may not mean anything. <laughs> they can mean a lot to the animal, mm -hmm. you know, so that's just sort of a problem solving with animals is what did you change? So and this is where farmers become scientists, you know, uh, and uh, I, I tell people, you know, you got to give yourself credit because <laughs> you're, you're not just farming. You're doing a whole slew of other different things. Um, and so being able to embrace all those different attributes to making a good farmer, observational skills being one of them, really will make a farmer more profitable in the long run. Um, do we have any more questions? Brittany? We did. We've had a bunch come in. Oh, okay. um, so if y'all are okay with that it. Too you know what? Is, it, is that because I'm too confusing or, or I don't give the good answer? No, you're giving great answers. And so people are thinking of more things they want to know. Okay. Um, going back to feed, Vivian, thanks for tuning in today. Um, she wanted to know, what are your favorite rations as you move into laying season? 
for geese? Uh, whole grain, pelleted, percent protein? Um, I would go with a pelleted feed. Uh, I have nothing against whole grains, but if, if you want to provide a balanced ration, uh, at least for us, I don't want to formulate my own feed. I, I want to leave that to a professional. So we give um, the requirements in a goose ration to our feed supplier and they make a ration, <clears throat> you know, X pounds of this and X pounds of this and X pounds of this. And obviously they grind it up, they mix it up, they put it in a pellet. So my first choice is a pellet because then probably every bite has the proper feed in the proper nutrient level. Uh, the other advantage of pellets is that by being pelleted, uh, it's killing any salmonella or anything like that during that pelleting process, which is of benefit. Um, and also, though geese can survive on ground feed, they much prefer a pelleted feed, and you're going to have less waste and separation in a pelleted feed versus a, a, a ground feed. Now, <clears throat> geese probably would prefer whole grains, uh, but how do you make a balanced ration out of whole grains when you have to have soybean meal or something like that in there? Then you've got a powder that just goes to the bottom. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the off season, when they're not laying, I, you know, I wouldn't object to a whole wheat, um, possibly a, as, as a maintenance ration or to use a maintenance ration 50-50 with whole wheat. Um, but uh, for the for the protein percent, it's about 17% for uh, geese that we want as protein. And we do have recommended nutrient levels on our website for somebody that wants to, to look that up for ducks and geese. Um, and, and that's just information we've accumulated. Is, is that the bottom line for everybody? No. <laughs> but, um, you know, we'll have people that um, give a lot of treats. You know, they'll say, well, can I feed a balanced pellet ration and then give them whole corn? Well, then you no longer have a balanced ration because now you've got more energy, you've got more linoleic acid, you got more of some things and you've got lower of those things that corn doesn't have much of. So um, I prefer a pelleted feed because that means it should be well balanced. And can I add on to that? Um, when you talk about uh, feeding livestock treats, uh, you, you might some people might think, well, but, but the feed is balanced. The treats is just an, just an add on. And the reality is their stomachs get full at some point. So if you're feeding, adding corn into um, you know, a whole general feed, they're going to be eating part corn and then the formulated feed, but they're not going to have a complete diet because that corn is being added into their limited size stomach. Um, so that's what John's talking about when he's saying it's not going to be a really complete diet for them um, because we're going to be eating more than or less than the actual formulated diet. Right, right. Uh, I mean, I can see, especially with animals that are not in production, you know, throwing pumpkins to geese in the winter. I mean, or, you know, after Halloween or something like that. that that's 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 fine. Uh, they enjoy it. It gives them something else to do. Um, and I will say that <clears throat> one thing we do, and I can't prove that it's a bit of any benefit. It was just a recommendation by um, a commercial goose producer from Europe that does very well in that they give their geese hay. Um, and, and we do the same. Uh, once a week, we go through a bale of hay. Now, it's not alfalfa. I would not recommend that. But we just use uh, like an oat hay or something like that um, for two reasons. Uh, they said it helped in digestion, which I wouldn't be surprised because geese can live off grass. Well, hay is just dried grass. Um, and it gives them something to do because geese are very smart. So... Um, 
just giving them something else to do, I think is a benefit to them as a animal that they're pulling it out. They're playing with it. They're finding the little kernels of oats. <clears throat> they're nibbling at that. They're dispensing with that. Something blows in the wind. They go chase it. You know, it just gives them a little bit more to do. So um, that might be considered a treat, <clears throat> but um, I, it, it's not a treat as in giving them a handful of corn because th there is nutritive value to the hay, uh, the grass hay or oat hay that we give them that is much like what they might have been eating if they had green grass. So, um, but you're absolutely right, Ryan, about adding treats and that it, you're throwing everything off then <laughs> if you're doing it significantly. But you did mention um, what a lot of research, lots of research call uh, enrichment, where you're allowing that animal to play, to be really what it was designed to be, to eat grass and nom, 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 nom. Right. Find those little special little treats in the hay. Um, so yeah, enrichment's always important for any livestock. It does help with that stimulation of the brain. Um, so yeah, another good suggestion from another wise man. Uh, do we have another question? We do. Let's see. Michelle, thanks for tuning in today. She wanted to know, can you keep geese as pets with ducks and chickens? Yes. And interestingly, um, I wrote an article on that for my pet chicken, and then I adopted parts of that, put it in the catalog this year. But <clears throat> we don't have any chickens here, so I can't speak with a lot of experience other than what other people have told me our customers that you can, you can keep them together, but just, just realize that they go about life differently. And so you have to be aware of that. You can't set up something for chickens and, and then just throw in ducks and geese and assume that everybody's gonna be happy. Um, the, the larger geese are gonna take more room. They have interests that the chickens don't. Um, you know, the ducks and geese at night live on the first floor and the chickens live on the second and third floor. So, you, you know, you you want to make sure the droppings of the chickens don't end up on the ducks and the geese down below or in their nests or things like that. So if they're given enough room, and I think that's the main criteria, they can get along. Um, the other thing I would say is that obviously you're going to have, well, most probably you're going to have one and then introduce something else. Remember that who you have now is what I call the home team. And the visiting team is gonna be the ones that are introduced. And the visiting team doesn't know the playing field. They don't know the locker room. They don't know where the showers are. They don't know anything. So it's it's almost better if, you're, if you have the option, uh, uh, let's say you have two pens. You've had chickens for a long time. <clears throat> And then you build a pen beside them and you put some ducks in there, and, and but you want them to run together. But the ducks are the newbies. You know, it might be a benefit to put the chickens who think they rule the roost in the duck pen because it's the duck's home field advantage there. So um, the bottom line is just be aware as you introduce animals to each other that they can get away from each other. But if they have enough room, they should they should do fine. Great. Let's see. Hi, Richard. Thanks for tuning in today. He wants to know, when someone describes a goose as multi-purpose, eggs, meat, grease, are they referring to grease for cooking or for grease used as a lubricant? Hmm. Uh, good question. I would assume it's for cooking uh, because, you know, they, they do sell duck fat, just duck fat by itself uh, for cooking purposes. <clears throat> I wouldn't be surprised if somebody is doing that for goose fat also, um, but there's just not the volume there to maybe make it worthwhile. I'm not a chef um, and, and I just don't know about as a lubricant. I'm sure you could find the right place and it would be a great lubricant, but that's out of my expertise. So I'm gonna choose the grease for cooking. <laughs> <laughs> It is very good in cooking. I can confirm that. <laughs> Let's see. 
let's see. Michelle also wants to know, can I feed my ducks, chickens, and geese a flock crumble from tractor supply and supplement with niacin? Do geese need additional niacin like ducks do? Um, yes, and not really. <laughs> so yes, you can um, get a flock crumble. And <clears throat> I would assume most feed has enough niacin. Um, I just don't know that uh, because there are people that have leg problems with geese, uh, excuse me, with ducks. It's, it's much less common in geese. It's more of a problem with ducks in terms of leg problems with niacin. Um, and, and for those that are not familiar with it, when ducks require more niacin than chickens. And so if you are feeding a chicken feed, there is the possibility of they're not having enough niacin, which is a vitamin, and it's critical for leg development. And they'll go from limping to bent legs without enough niacin. So if you do have ducklings um, and you start to see any kind of leg problems, it wouldn't hurt to add some niacin. Um, now, I don't want to go into how much to add. I mean, I've got a blog on that, my website, and I'm not trying to push everybody to my website, but I sort of go into the math of, well, how many do you have and how many are they eating and do you use tablets or do you put it in the water? You know, there's different ways of doing it. Um, and so for those that want sort of an exact answer, <laughs> that's where I'd go versus a guess. Um, but I've seen very little evidence of leg problems in geese concerning niacin. I mean, all our feed has plenty of niacin um, and we still occasionally have problems with geese and legs, uh, extremely rare in ducks. And I perceive with the geese, it is because they're just growing too fast. And that's not a niacin problem. That's probably that they were just fed at too high a level. Thank you, Michelle. Like we got some scientists asking questions too. That's oh, all right. Uh, Angie wants to know. Thanks for tuning in today. What brew, What breed of goose would you recommend for a beginner to raise for meat? Um, if if you're just speaking of geese, I would do Emden. Uh, it's a white goose. It's probably the largest goose. It is the only one grown commercially in large quantities um, in North America, and that's what we use. Um, if you're going for a heritage breed, then I would look at something like a, a buff, um, maybe a pilgrim. Those are larger geese. Um, the problem with a pilgrim is with any dark feathered bird, it'll leave pigments in the skin. And we as consumers are so used to a clean skin. Uh, I think that's why every poultry is now white feathered because they don't leave any pigments in the skin. You know, turkeys naturally were colored. Now they're white. Chickens were naturally colored. Now they're white. Ducks were naturally colored. Now they're white. Geese, et cetera. Um, so that's something to consider. But um, buff, the, the feathers are light enough that that should not be a problem of leaving uh pigments in the skin to uh, make people sort of shy away from the carcass. All right, great question, Angie. I think we've got one more here. Ooh. Anna is new to agriculture and she says, can I groom, like pluck extra feathers off geese while they're alive? Will they grow back like sheep grow their fleece or wool back? Um, that is, at number one, there's no stupid question. It just shows that you're brave enough to ask it. Absolutely. So I applaud you for overcoming your concern about a stupid question. Um, I'd much rather have a question asked than you wonder about it to the very end. Okay. Um, so this is interesting in that um, there are places in the world where geese are the, the breast feathers are processed while they're live. And what they're doing or trying to do is to harvest those feathers right before they're molted and lost. Now, as I indicated with geese, they'll go through three sets of feathers. 
So the thought is, well, why don't we harvest those feathers before they just lose them in the wind? And um, I don't think that's done in the United States anymore. It what We sell uh, ducks and geese to Hooterite colonies, which are in the United States and in Canada. And um, they have a tradition of eating goose at holidays. And these are communities of 50 to 110 people. Um, and they used to do that, that they would time it just right so that they could harvest these feathers. Um, and from I never saw it done, but from talking to them, they didn't feel it was a big stress on the birds because they wanted to do it when it's not a stress. They were growing these birds for meat. That was the ultimate objective. So they, they didn't want to stress them and growing them, that'd be counterproductive. So I'm guessing if it's done correctly, you can harvest them. Obviously, if you see any bleeding or something, well, you've chosen the wrong date. Um, but I don't think they do it anymore. Um, and I don't know how much of that is due to animal welfare concerns or the perception of other people in terms of animal uh, welfare. Uh, I think it had to do more with that the the people just hated doing it, um, not because of what it was doing to the birds, but uh, um, just not having enough time. And then they're saying, oh, we've got to do this for 500 geese and it's going to take, you know, six women and five kids so you guys can't do what you were doing. You have to come over and do this for two days. Plus, I think the, the value of the feathers dropped. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's still being done in places like China, where a lot of geese are being grown. Um, but it, it is not, you know, from my rambling on here for several minutes, it was not a stupid question. Uh, you can do it. I've never done it. Um, but you just have to be careful that you do it when, obviously, when they're going to lose those feathers. And you don't even do the breast. You don't do anything else because I think it's the breast feathers that are typically of greatest value and there's the most down there uh, for whatever you're going to use your feathers on. Um, uh, so there you go. Uh, they will grow it back. Now, if, if you had an adult goose that was done growing, and at you know, 25 weeks, you went and plucked the feathers. Number one, uh, those feathers would not be ready to be dropped. So it'd be really difficult to pluck them live. Uh, so there would be an issue there. And those, they would not grow back. But if you time it so that those are feathers that are ready to be dropped, then yes, they would be replaced just in the natural cycle of things. So good question. Ooh. Yes, thank you for asking. Well, I had one last question, and I know we are almost at that one hour mark. And so uh, feel free to, you know, um, answer it as quick as you possibly can. Um, my question, and this is kind of in a uh, our pre interview conversation where we talked about the profitability of geese and, and how that was really hard with just heritage. But one thing that you did mention, uh, John, in that conversation is uh, not just doing heritage, but also seeing if that combo of your standard breads versus your heritage uh, or with your heritage um, as marketing points for selling geese overall uh, to consumers. Really yeah. talk about that. Right. Um, yeah, uh, we did discuss this. And, and the point was that if you walk into a butcher shop with heritage geese, they're going to be more expensive than an Emden goose because uh, they're not as big. So you have to charge more per pound. Um, you could walk, you could raise both kinds of geese. You could have buff geese and you could have Emden geese. And you walk in and you say, <clears throat> you know, I'm going two kinds of geese, um, uh, the, the typical Emden goose, and, and I'm charging you, $10 a pound. I'm just pulling a number out. It would be more than that. Let's say $10 a pound for a normal goose. But if, you know, we're we're trying to preserve heritage breeds and we've got buff geese at $15 a pound. So it gives that person a choice. You know, I, I personally, I always like to have a choice. And so if this is a butcher that says, well, I've never had geese, so I'm not going to go the buff route, but I'll do the Emden, you know, 
because they're a third less than the heritage. Whereas if it's somebody that has had um, geese before, they say, you know, I like the concept of heritage. So I'll go the other ones. So if you walk in with two, you, it gives somebody a choice. You're not just saying this is it, buy it or not. You, you walk in with two. And then that person can justify in their mind one or the other. So um, it was just an idea that uh, because they can all be grown together, they can be processed at the same time. So it's really not that much harder to raise one over the other. So it was just a, a, a marketing consideration. Good. So thank you for bringing that up, Ryan. Yeah, you know, you answered that so quick. I want to ask you another question. Uh, again, this is from that previous conversation. Uh, and you throw this out there. I was like, I, I didn't even think that that could be an idea. Uh, you mentioned to selling to parks, uh, natural um, event spaces, as well as homesteaders as a really good market for uh, those who are considering selling uh, geese live. Talk really quickly about that as well. Well, <clears throat> Um, a lot of people don't want to go through the, the problems of raising a baby. And so it might be just the option of selling adult breeders as pairs or trios or just flocks to people. Um, and that gives you a longer marketing opportunity also because, you know, they're pretty much fully feathered and close to mature size at 12 to 15 weeks. But it's not like a process bird that you got to meet a time when the feathers are easy to pluck. If you're selling adults, <coughs> excuse me, you can you can start to sell them at 12 weeks, but you've got 30 weeks to sell them. Now, your price might want to go up as they're eating more, but you're not under the constraints of getting rid of them right away. Um, so it could be to, uh, you know, um, what I, I forget the term, but parks or museums that are living farms kind of places that would be interested in them. Um, or, or just parks, you know, typically people drop birds off at parks. They don't need to buy any, but, um, it, it, you just have to be creative and keep your, you know, ears and eyes open for other marketing opportunities for, for the adult birds. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Ryan. Uh, no, uh, your genius was just so big that I just cowered over it. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, Brittany, do we have any final questions from our audience? No final questions. I think we answered them all. Woo! Well, let me just say, John, this has been exciting. Um, thank you again for participating in this. I believe that your wisdom really will allow for those, even considering raising geese, um, to really have a more profitable mindset in terms of making profitability for their enterprise. Uh, so again, thank you for your time. Uh, really quick announcements. Next month is pig month. All right, pig month. I love pigs, so I'm gonna be doing all of the pig chats. So definitely show up, show out. We're gonna, what are we doing, pig months? What, what are the days for those? Mondays? Uh, no, Tuesdays at two. Uh, for our species chat, and then we'll do a swine marketing Monday on the last Monday of the month when that's with Tracy. Yep, from Hillbilly. That's Hillbilly. the one. Yep, so I'm going to be doing all those. Um, so feel free to come back, uh, ask all of your pick questions. Uh, if the farmers can't answer it, I probably can. Um, so, anyways, again, John, thank you for your time. Thank you for everyone in the audience who participated in this. We really, really appreciate it. Um, if you're ever considering about being a member of the Livestock Conservancy, give us a check out. Um, go to the livestockconservancy.org and we have a whole bunch of information, resources. Um, if you simply just want to donate, we'll accept your money too. Any final thoughts? I think that about covers it. I'm going to put up John's website here. So Metzer Farms, just in case anybody had further questions or they wanted to read some of your blogs you talked about today. Um, and just thanks to all of our members and supporters who make this program possible. We wouldn't be here without you. So thank you. And um, 
it's year end giving. Don't forget, <laughs> make, make your your gift before the end of the year. So that's my shameless plug. <laughs> It's a, it's an excellent organization. I was a board member for I don't know eight or ten years or something. So um, it's it's very worthwhile uh, to support the organization. So I I give my wholehearted support to the Livestock Conservancy. Well, thank you so much for that glowing testimonial. We really appreciate it, and we appreciate all of your work and all that you do. Well, thank you. It was a very uh, enjoyable hour. <laughs> Hope everyone has a great afternoon and we will be back next week. Bye, y'all. Right. Bye, Bye now.